This next story is about some of the oddest fish on the planet, seahorses. They're not exactly speedy, but they're incredibly fascinating, especially when they start showing up in the hundreds at a place where no one expected they would. These nets were installed at Manly Beach in Sydney, Australia, to keep dangerous marine life away. So when the swimmers come down here for a, um, a little paddle or a bit of a swim, they feel safe so they can't be eaten by any sharks or stingrays or anything that might be in the harbour. The sharks are shut out, but a new party of sea creatures has moved in. And this net is actually home to a large colony of seahorses. About 400 animals live on this net. Biologist David Harasti knows he's counted each one. I think they like the net so much because they've got a lot of buddies there. It's a social thing for one. It's like if you go out uh, to a club or something, you want to go where there's lots of people and it's popular. Well, that's what the net is. It's, you know, it's a big rave for seahorses. David wants to keep the party going because the main guests are a seahorse called YTI, a protected species. Australia is the only place that you're going to find these seahorses. But the problem? This party is always getting trashed. What happens on this net? This net gets a lot of rubbish on it and it gets a lot of growth. And the growth gets really heavy and it makes the net collapse, so the net actually falls down. So councils over the years have been cleaning the net on an ad hoc basis and using contractors to beat off all the growth. But unfortunately, it's had major impacts on the seahorse population. Last time they did a big clean here, the seahorses disappeared. Now David is trying to find a way to clean the nets without killing the seahorses. He started by dividing the net into different zones. In one section, what we did, we did a complete clean where we took all the growth off that section. Another section, we left some growth up uh, the top section. The next section, we only had growth on the bottom. And then we had a control where we didn't touch the net, so we just left, left existing growth. Before cleaning the net, he removes the seahorses. He keeps track of where each one comes from. After cleaning, he puts them back in the same place. David returns regularly to check on them and see if there are any new visitors. Right now, we're going to go along the net. We're going to see if we can find any of the animals that aren't tagged. One thing that we have learned is that the majority of seahorses, like 90% of them, like to be within a metre of the bottom. To find them, David walks along the bottom, lifting up the net. They camouflage well, so they're not always easy to spot. While he's looking, he has to watch a step. We have these electric rays in Australia. And quite often, because you're walking along the bottom, you'll step on one of these electric rays and you get this massive shock. So I'm trying to count seahorses, all of a sudden I'm dancing with an electric ray under my feet. Very, very annoying. Once he spots a seahorse, he has to coax it off the net. They have very, very tough tails. They hold onto this net with the tails very tightly curled around it. But if you can get your finger underneath it and you can encourage the seahorse to come off, and then you know, you're one of the, it's one of the few animals that you can actually shake hands with underwater. Sometimes David tags the seahorses underwater. Tagging underwater is a little bit harder to do. It, it takes a bit more time because a bit of water movement, a bit of surge, it's a bit hard to get the needle in. Today the water is a bit murky. David decides to collect the seahorses in a bag and tag them on land. There's heaps of seahorses out there today. I've got about eight in here that I'm going to tag now. And then we'll um, put them back out in the net in about half an hour or so. There are two kinds of seahorses that can be found here. The white seahorse and the potbelly seahorse. Today he's managed to collect some of each species. This is actually a potbelly seahorse. This is, one of the, this is one of the largest seahorses in the world. Both species will get tagged with this colourful dye. It's like putting a name tag on each one of them. Every colour combination is unique. Then each seahorse is measured so David can monitor their growth rate. He wants to make sure they're getting enough to eat on the net. Now this one here, this is a male and he's got a big pouch and inside this pouch he'd have probably about 100 babies at the moment. One of the attractions to him and why I researched on him is that I found out many years ago that it's the only animal in the world where a male gives birth and I think that's a very cool thing. He'll put this one back today, but to make sure the party never stops, he's put female and male horses from the net in the Manly Aquarium. Once the male gives birth, the babies will be put onto the net. That has implications for the rest of Australia if there's population seahorses that decline. If they do survive when we release them, we might be able to introduce seahorses into other areas of Australia and perhaps in other areas of the world, such as Indonesia and Philippines, where populations aren't as great as they used to be. David will observe the seahorses for a few more months before telling Sydney Council his results. But he already has a good idea of what he's going to say. At this stage, it's 
It's not completely ironclad, the, the data's still got to be analysed, but I'm pretty sure if we leave a bottom layer of growth a metre from the bottom, the seahorses will be happy. And the nets will be fine because you've removed all the really heavy growth from the top two metres, and that's what the council need to do. Remove the heavy growth without harming the seahorses, leave a bit of growth on the bottom. This way, the net does not fall down from the weight of growth and garbage, and the seahorse party still keeps on raving. Hey, that